insert witty intro comment here. I've been drinking. I am Evo Terra, and this is the Books and Beer Hangout. Welcome to another episode of the Books and Beer Hangout. My name is Jeff Moriarty, and our topic today is funding creative projects with Kickstarter. So we're going to go right to our guest and source of incredible wisdom on this topic. Uh, Nelson, would you please introduce, introduce yourself? Blah, blah, blah. Um, hi, I'm Nelson DeWitt. I am the author of A Kickstarter's Guide to Kickstarter. I'm also a three-time Kickstarter working on my fourth project now. Um, you know, I just can't get enough of it. But uh, basically, I've been really interested in what it takes to kind of launch a successful project on Kickstarter, which has led me to interview other successful Kickstarters and just do a whole lot of research into what how, how the site actually works and how we as creatives can use it. Interesting, but we have a much more important topic to start with. Are you drinking beer? Uh, Actually, I am drinking some Starbucks salted caramel hot chocolate, <laughs> one of my favorites. So that's a no. <laughs> but that's okay because Jeff and I are probably drinking beer for you. So, Jeff, I am having a Whitmore Brothers black, no, no, pitch black IPA. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty decent and, and tasty. How about you? So I've gone uh, weird beer again. Yeah. I have a Bad Attitude Two Penny from Ooh. Switzerland. Really? Which is pretty darn tasty. Pretty That's darn tasty. Hmm. Where would yeah. you find that? Uh, AJ's oh, here okay. in town. Right. Yeah, there's, the guy near us is getting in all kinds of beer from all over the world. So the okay. Swiss, they got their borders down. I'm going to have to check him out. All right, enough of the beer talk. Let's get back into the publishing talk, and let's talk about books, and let's talk about creatives. And, you know, Kickstarter is definitely a, a, a source that many people are, are turning to on that one. But, but, but before we get into that, Nelson, I want to back up. You mentioned you're a three-time Kickstarter. What, what types of projects have you funded? So my first project I started back in the fall of 2010. It was for a documentary film that I wanted to make with a friend of mine. Uh, or, and uh, that was, uh, we were actually one of the first 10,000 projects on the site, so that was a pretty interesting experience. Um, so we really didn't know what we were doing, and we got very fortunate that we have amazing friends and family, and we hit our goal of uh, $15,000 to start the film. Uh, that was the first one. And then after that, I said, uh, hey, this makes a lot of sense for whatever reason. I kind of figured out uh, or understood some things about the site and the way it works, so I decided to write a book. And my second project was a Kickstarter's guide to Kickstarter funded on Kickstarter, of course. That's very recursive. I love it. Yeah. The, part of that was on pur purpose. Uh, but uh, So that was the second project, and that one did very well. Uh, I went for $900 and ended up with $1,300. And then the third project, which I ran in February, was for a uh, photo book that I wanted to create. And uh, it was called Street by Southwest. So I wanted to go to the South by Southwest Festival and shoot the whole thing in street photography genre. And that failed spectacularly. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I, but the good news is that I sort of learned a lot from that experience. And it kind of, you know, helped me understand things that I didn't quite know with the first few projects. So I've done this a couple times now and um, between that and talking with other people I sort of really have a good sense of what Kickstarter is and maybe more importantly what it's not. Well you know I learned of you through that dismal failure um, that, that we put out. You, you talked about it a lot. On it was spectacular. It was a spectacular Spectacular. Failure. Thank you. Thank you. Probably a bit uh, of both. <laughs> you, you talked about it on, on Google Plus and, that, and that's how I found uh, out about you and shared the story because I, I thought it was, you provided some real great insight and information. Uh, before we get into that though, I mean, so your first one did great, 15 grand. Um, the second one, you said, I'm just writing a book, so I don't need as much money. Give me 900 make $1,300. It's an order of magnitude less and a little bit more. Um, uh, and then this one did even less than that. So will you have to pay Kickstarter for your next funding? Will you actually go in the hole and be in the red is what I want to know. Um, maybe, yeah. There's, there's a downward trend there. 
Um, no, but but I sort of, you know, after the first one, I, I realized that it was primarily for friends and family funding that project, and I realized I couldn't kind of go back to that well. You know, I, I've asked them once, I don't want to go back to them and say, I want to do this thing or that thing. Uh, so it really pushed me to think about how do I do projects which go beyond that friends and family. And one of the reasons that that uh, Street by Southwest project failed is because I was really reaching for beyond friends and family. And um, I mean, I, I it totally failed, but I think, you know, I sort of learned what it takes to get out of that, you know, get to the next level. So I want to come back and, and tease that open a little bit more later, but uh, first, why did you go to Kickstarter in the first place? What else had you looked at as a source of funding? Had you tried, you know, maxing out the credit cards and, and, uh, uh, and everything else, why, what made you pull the trigger there? Uh, I had heard about uh, Kickstarter. Um, I, I read a lot of, uh, you know, TechCrunch or whatever, and um, I heard of the site, and, and I think it was on a, a Seth Godin book or something, but me and, and my partner on, on the film really felt like this was a platform, and it was something that resonated with both of us. I'm, you know, very much in, in the tech were interested in the tech world and uh, it was just something that I wanted to try and then when he approached me about doing this documentary film I was like great here's an opportunity to do something that would uh, you know go in that we could use on the platform um, really there wasn't much else out there in, in at the time like mid 2010 like crowdsourcing was just kind of taking off so it was kind of that or well, what was that what was that first time like, I mean, what um, going into it? How did you, you know? How did you set up a, a, the price you wanted and your um, rewards and everything else? Did you just spitball it, or what was your what was your experience the first time through? Uh, we kind of fumbled through it. <laughs> That's the best way to describe it. Um, you know, the first time we, I remember we had a lot of discussions about how much we wanted to raise. You know, and we were kind of going between, you know. 20,000, 15,000, 10,000, what seems safer, what's, what could we do? And, and we really didn't base that on anything other than just do we feel like we could do that and not knowing what that meant on the other side. Now, did, um, did, how much does Kickstarter take? How much do they well, take? They take 5%. Okay. Uh, they take 5% and then Amazon takes roughly 3%. So you, you're looking at anywhere between 5 to 10% that, that you sort of lose. So you have to kind of budget that in. Okay. Um, but, yeah, we, we didn't really know what we were doing, and we created a whole bunch of rewards and kind of ended up, the, ended up with 13 different backing levels and, like, different combinations of rewards. And after I was done, I was like, oh, this is a mess. Like, it, it wasn't very well thought out at all. So on the next project, I really tried to focus on, you know, what are the rewards, what's the structure of them, and, and tried to do that whole, the execution of the project a lot better. So how many rewards would you, you know, did you do the second time around? You had 13 the first time, you went to five, went to five. six. Okay. I went to five. I really tried to push myself to, can I offer five, like only five rewards? And the other thing I tried to do was I only made them digital because, uh, you know, part of my thinking was uh, with the guide is if you, like, is this a book that you would curl up next to the fire and read? And my answer was no. So I thought it should be a, a digital book. And and I knew from from the first project that, you have to mail out the rewards. So if I'm giving people T-shirts and DVDs and whatever else, then there's the cost of sending it and producing it. You know, so going digital kind of makes that whole process easier. Now, did you find that the the physical rewards versus the digital? Um, you know, what were the things that people gravitated to? Was it the 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 different levels, the price levels, or the objects themselves, or kind of what what seemed to really get people clicking in terms of those incentives? Um, at the time, I'm not really sure. I, I think it's it, it's kind of a complicated question, and the way I would answer it is 
it's it's not about stuff. It's not about the individual like thing. Am I getting a book or a T-shirt or whatever? And and when we when people talk about rewards, that's where they go to. You know, like do I get a DVD versus a T-shirt? And from my experience, I would say that most of my friends and family did not back me specifically for that. You know, T-shirt or or whatever they were backing to support it. And if they got something out of it, great. Of course, you want to give them that stuff, but um, and then I think the second project, yeah, the rewards were a little more important because you you are sort of uh, you, you want people to get the book, you want people to get the interviews, and you want people to be happy. But now my view is really it, it, there are good rewards in my mind are rewards that are a product of the of the project itself or provide a compelling experience. And that's something I, I think people um, I'm trying to play with a little more. How do you make this experience of being part of the Kickstarter project really freaking awesome? And and that's what gets people excited. Yeah, so less a piece of swag and more something that the only way you're going to get this cool thing, you're not going to find this for sale on Amazon or on, on eBay later on, any of that kind of stuff, something really, really inventive. We, we've spent a lot of time talking about the incentives, um, and, and I want to get back to talk about the, the overall mechanics, um, a little bit more of that thing. Obviously, you've written an entire book about it, so I don't want you to tell me the book in the next two minutes, but some of the critical pieces I would imagine is a fantastic you know, write-up and description, which I would think authors should accept sell at, although unfortunately they don't. Um, but I know there's also the video element. Are, are, are there some, is there a simple formula that you should follow on something like this, or is it you know, just kind of do what you got to do? So I, I think authors are at a bit of an advantage here if they play their cards right. To me, the thing that you are doing on that Kickstarter page with your pitch is you're telling a really good story, right? You have to tell a story of why this project needs to exist. And if you don't get funded, why, you know, why is it sad if, if this project doesn't happen? You know, I, I think that's the goal is to really not to sit, go there and say, hey, I have an idea for a book and I need your money to do it. But to say, you know, I've been working on this thing for three years and it's keeping me up at night and I just can't put it down and I need your help to take it the final stage of the way. I think that's a much more compelling pitch and indeed, from what, I, from what I've seen, the projects that do very well have a really, really good story element to them where the creator is talking about their journey, their passion, and why they just can't walk away from this project. So um, to, to bring up, just because it was spectacular, you know, if it was just a, a minor failure, we could probably let it go. But a spectacular failure, I mean, really deserves some, some, some love. So uh, your, your third project. What would you say is the you know the one or two big things that that made that not work and or the most surprising? Yeah. So this was really interesting to me because I, I sort of knew how important that storytelling element was, and I really, really focused on telling just the absolute best story I could. I mean, I worked on that project video for three months and it showed people really loved it, but it, it turned out that what I was trying to do just didn't work with the story I was telling. And I'll back up a little bit. So the project was to publish a this photography book, and I was going for $10,000. When I started out the project, I hadn't taken the pictures. I, I had started working on the style of photography, getting better at that. Um, but I didn't actually have any photos to show people, and I hadn't made a book. So I was kind of like in the middle of my project. I wasn't, um, I, it, the way I, I think about it now is I didn't have like a prototype. I didn't have something to show people on camera, hey, look at this cool photo book. And I was just trying to sell the story of it, and, and I don't think that that worked. And then the other thing I did, which um, didn't work, was that $10,000 half of that was to cover the costs I had already put in and half of it was to produce the book. And I think that what I've learned is you really want to make that project goal as, as small as possible uh, and really cut back and, and you have to wait until you're sort of ready to launch. And 
And what I mean is, like, it, unless you have something to show for for your work, for what you want to do, then it's very hard for people to back you. It's so it's not to... not something at the ideation phase. You want to have right. something tangible you can share. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that makes it so much better. And the, the difference between sort of the guide and the photo book was the guide, I showed people what I had already started working. And I said, even if you don't fund me, I'm still writing this and I'm putting it out for free. So I was like, I'm doing this whether you back me or not. And I think that that sent a very different message from I am broke and I need money to do this project. You know, And even if that wasn't my intention, that might have been the message that came across. Nelson, you, you've talked about the video aspect, and, and I've heard others talk about that, that video aspect. And it seems to me just looking through the Kickstarter page and uh, finding the successful – the, the things that received tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not even more than that, they all seem to have this element of a really killer video that conveys the message. Um, a, is that criti critical? And B, what if you're not a filmmaker? How do you make a good video? Um, I have seen one of my favorite videos of all time is someone on their webcam just like this and and they're talking uh, it's uh, the parade of a thousand night demons or something I can send you a link later anyway the guy, the guy is on his webcam and he's just talking about how much he loves these Japanese folklore and the illustrations that he's doing and you, you just get hooked and it's his passion that I think tells that story way better than than fancy graphics or, or videos or anything like that. So if you don't have a high budget, if you don't have a lot of video production skills, just sit in front of the camera and tell people why you love what you're doing. And I think that that goes much farther than, than people really think. Is there a type of creative project that you think right now is either underrepresented or particularly red hot that you're that you're seeing out there since you're so connected with Kickstarter? I think uh, in my mind they're really sort of two different types of of Kickstarter projects uh, maybe it's a little more complicated than that but there are the projects that we read about on the blogs which are these huge successes they're usually either uh, consumer products or it's the Amanda Palmer, Seth Godin's, the people with the really big followings who are going on the site and they're doing some project and their fans just show up in, in droves. Um, the other projects, uh, and this is an interesting fact, that 92% of all projects on Kickstarter raise less than $20,000. So that's like everyone else. And... And that's what most people experience, in, and that's what I experience. So I, I recently put out another post, which people can check out later, but it, it basically says, yeah, most people really only raise between, you know, ten to $20,000 at most and are funded by less than 300 people. And that I think you know the the myth the lore of, of crowdsource funding is that you're gonna post your project and hundreds and thousands of people are just gonna come knocking down your door and what I would encourage people to think about or understand is that's usually not the case and that's okay like you're that's perfectly fine like there's so many so much good stuff including this hangout that's come from that guide which was a very small project but obviously it had some meaning uh, with, with, with people. So. Okay, so uh, a couple more for you here. Um, what about the other services out there like Indiegogo? Um, are, you a, are you Kickstarter through and through? Is there some benefit to the others? How do they compare? My, my response to this question is it doesn't matter. And, and I say that because I think the mechanics of crowdsource funding are really the same no matter what site you go to. And where people kind of get confused or mixed up is thinking that Kickstarter or Indiegogo or any of the, these other sites 
is going to bring the audience and that's really not the case and it's really up to you the creator to bring your audience to Kickstarter or Indiegogo or whatever site and what I say to people is if your project doesn't fit within the constraints of, of Kickstarter then just go to Indiegogo and run it there because you can do the same type of project on either site for the most part of course each site has their guidelines but really the most important thing is is audience can you bring you know can you get that project page a thousand views fifteen hundred views two thousand views if you're able to do that you have a much greater chance of success than whether you're on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Yeah, I think that's the key not only to Kickstarter success, but you know, any creative project success is being able to put that in front of a large enough audience and the bigger you can actually do that, the better. And of course people think about things like advertising and stuff and that that's I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just having enough people interested in something, which means you've got to have a giant base from what you work with, uh, in a platform as it's been called before, um, or have something that's truly remarkable. And, and that's kind of my fear of things is that there are so many people who are looking at us, hey, here's an instant money project that hundreds of thousands of people a day are putting the project put there and, and they're just crap projects. They're not well thought out and, and I'm, I'm afraid that's, you know, this may be the straw man crazy, you know, slippery slope ar argument that eventually too much crap's going to be there but the reality is that there's too much crap anywhere. So, so maybe I'm, maybe I'm crazy about that. Uh, but what about your next project? What are you, what are you really trying to do different for the next time around? So I, I'm again, I'm going back to the drawing board with how do I change people's expectations with experience? How do I keep the rewards as simple as possible? And where, when, probably most importantly, when do I launch the project? Um, you know, so basically there's sort of four stages of an idea. There's, oh, I have an idea. Then there's, okay, I've done some research. And then there's this sort of in-between stage. And then there's, okay, here I built a working prototype and it doesn't really, you know, do what I want it to. Uh, I, I think Kickstarter works very well when you've done some research and you can prove that. So when I went to my friends and family and I said I had a very good video and I laid out what I wanted to do and people saw that I was seeing people's expectations with the experience. How do I make this more than just you're getting a book? Um, I'm trying to you know wait longer in the process to launch the thing and I'm trying to think about how do I get my message out to more people? Who do I have to reach ahead of time before the project launches and and that's actually one thing that I, I'd like to say uh, you know a big lesson learned from the street by Southwest I did that in my own you know in my own world showed it to my my you know close friends and family and they liked it but then when I showed it to the audience I was trying to reach they said no way yeah, it's one of the dangers of uh, the friends and family because they like you. It's like, this is great, and getting yeah. that honest, you know, hey, this isn't quite what I'm looking for, uh, right. which is the feedback you need, you don't always get. Right. So um, some people might be watching and getting all kinds of crazy ideas from listening to you and what they might be able to fund. So somebody doing a Kickstarter for the first time, our, our final question here, uh, what would you recommend that they do before starting the Kickstarter program, maybe that they wouldn't normally think of, and what should they really avoid? I would, I guess the one thing I, I would really encourage people to do is take their time with it and to do their homework. I think that Kickstarter projects are a lot harder than people think about, and the one thing I would really think about is who is the audience that I'm trying to reach? And nine times out of ten, that's going to be your friends and family. And, and we all like to go for the big audience, you know, the hundreds and thousands of people out there who like um, horror books or zombie books or street photography. But if you're not, if you can't get your friends and family in your close circles to back the project, getting complete strangers is going to be almost impossible. And, and then I think the, the thing that you should avoid is just throwing stuff up there without um, really thinking it through, you know, or or for that matter, spamming people with with projects that haven't been like 
put through their paces. So I, I think it's it's really just take your time, do your homework, think about what you want to do, um, and and you know sometimes on on the complete opposite note, sometimes people have quirky, fun projects that just sort of take off. And if that's what you're trying to do, fine, do that. But you know, other than that, really think about what what goes into this process. Right. Right. That sounds like real, real solid advice there, Nelson. Um, and we'll end on that fantastic note. So that is a wrap for the Books and Beer Hangout. Thanks very much, Nelson, for joining us today. And thanks to all of you out there who have found the show, no matter how that might have been. We record the Books and Beer Hangout on Thursday nights. It's also simulcast on YouTube Live. And that happens at 6 p.m. Pacific time each of these times. Links to our prior episodes, uh, as well as information on Nelson, as well as our older guests on here, can be found at booksandbeer.com. For more information, education, and insight into the world of a digital author today, please visit us at epublishunum.com. For Jeff Moriarty, I'm Evo Terra. Thanks for watching.